Well, hey, good morning, Redemption Church. How's everyone doing this morning? It's like, all right, we kind of wish we were sleeping still, if we're being honest. That is fine. Hey, I'm one of the pastors here at Redemption Church. It's great for everyone here in person. Welcome. Everyone who's joined us online, welcome this morning. Today is an exciting Sunday. As you've heard from Pastor Brandon, we have so many things to celebrate and to be excited for. And there's actually a couple of other things that are happening that I'm really excited about that are happening this week on our campus. So as you guys know, we've been talking about prayer this year, right? So we started out the year and we're in this spiritual discipline of prayer. And as a church, we've been thinking of how can we incorporate prayer into the DNA of who we are? So there's a couple things that we've done with that. And one of the things specifically that we've done is we just opened our very first prayer room. And so a few months ago, uh, maybe five, six months ago, a very special woman in our church by the name of Simone passed away and her family wanted to do something special in her honor and she loved Redemption Church. And so they actually donated towards this prayer room. And so we've been working on getting this thing together and ready for you guys. And what's really exciting is it's ready. And it looks so good, it's so exciting. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna launch it with 24 hours of prayer starting this Wednesday. So at 12 a.m., so I know you're probably gonna have your alarm set, you're gonna be up and like, okay, 11.59, there we go, 12. Starting at 12, you can start booking a time in the prayer room. The prayer room is located here on campus, right around the corner. That probably doesn't help you guys. You're like, there's corners everywhere in this place. So if you go out this building, like you're going towards this, this door right here, like you're going towards our kids, and make a left down the breezeway, you'll see our, our signage for our prayer room. And essentially, it's a space where you can sign up all, all times of the day or night, and you can come in and just have a place to be quiet, to be solitary, sit and pray and seek the Lord and We've even got some area in there where you can leave prayer requests. So if you're comfortable leaving things for others to pray for, you can put those on the wall and leave those. And then the other thing that we're doing is we have this Holy Week prayer guide. So hopefully you got one of these as you came in. Hopefully our, our wonderful connections team got you one of these. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about more of that here later in the service. So today what we're essentially doing, church, is we're kind of putting a bow on this series. Like I said, starting at the beginning of the year, back in January, which seems way further than what it really is. For I'm like, gosh, this year is flying by, my goodness. So back in January, we always like to start the spiritual discipline and say, what are we gonna focus on as a church? And this year, we said we need to focus on the spiritual discipline of prayer. And so we've been looking at what that means, like how do we pray? What do we pray for? When do we pray? What do we do, and this is a big one, what do we do if our prayers aren't answered? Right, like how do, we, how do we deal with that? And today, as we wrap everything up, we're gonna be talking about why is it so difficult, even hard work at times to pray? Why is it so difficult? So Tiff and I, my wife and I, we've been married for 22 years this year. I know I don't look that old. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I do get it all the time. Just kidding. I never get that. They're like, really, 22? That makes sense. Uh, so we've been married 22 years, and we have this fun little game, you know, and if you're married, you probably do this, but we have like our honey-do lists, and she, we have this like fun little unwritten game that we play where she'll put things on the honey-do list that are like way too difficult and above my pay grade to do, and I'm like, joke's on you, I'm gonna give it the old college try. And so she doesn't love that, I'll tell you that. So when I get an easy thing on the list, I'm pretty excited, because I'm like, I can knock it out and go do something fun after. So many years ago, this was probably 13, 14 years ago. So we were early into our marriage career at this point. So she asks me to put the Christmas decorations away. They're in the garage, and she's like, hey, we need to get those put in the attic. So timing-wise, I don't remember exactly, if I'm putting Christmas decorations away, it's probably like August, give or take. So just kidding. It was for sure no later than May, for sure. So she asked me to put them up, and I'm like, yes, I have a whole day. You know, I'm gonna be able to, to watch football to whatever I wanna do, right? Whatever it is, I'm gonna have time for it. Knock this job out. So... I go out into the garage, I'm excited, probably a little too energetic, and I pull down the attic ladder. And as I pull down the ladder, I like to be efficient. Men do not believe in more than one load. Amen, men, right? Like, 
Why do two loads when you can just do one and nearly kill yourself? So I'm, I wanted to sit on the edge of the attic door. So you guys picture this, right? Like my feet are hanging and I can grab the box, you know, or three, pick them up and set them up. So I climb up the ladder and I was just gonna do just like a little hop, hop and sit on the edge. I don't know why I was gonna hop. That's a crazy part of the story, but that's what I did. So I get to like the third step and I jump and you would think that my entire life depended on this jump. Like you would think I was getting paid per inch of this jump because I jumped in a way that I've never jumped before. I've never jumped that high in my entire life. And I jumped so high, I clear the beam that I was trying to land on and my entire backside went through the roof, through the ceiling of the garage. So, so I start... By the grace of God, I caught myself between the beams. I don't know how. I'm very, very, my reflexes are very slow. So I'm hanging here. My rear end is sticking out. I mean, this is crazy. Um, I'm hollering at Tiff. I don't have a picture of the exact moment, but I feel like it looked like this, give or take. This is probably, just picture it's my backside. And so I'm yelling at Tiff. I have no idea what she's gonna offer other than like, you know, companionship, because she's not pushing me out of this, you know, and she's, she's vertically challenged, so it wouldn't be super helpful there. So I'm hanging there, but what I will say, we eventually got me out of the ceiling, and I do, this is not relevant to the story, but I did repair the ceiling. Joke's on her, I did. I repaired the ceiling, and she came out, and this is a compliment for her. She meant this in a nice way, but she was like, wow, babe, it actually looks like a professional did that. And I'm like, Okay, I mean, thank you, but also that hurt my soul, but thank you, right? So <clears throat> the reason I tell that story is, so in my mind, I go out to do this job, and I'm thinking, gosh, this is gonna be so simple, I'm gonna check it off my list and go about my day, but once I got there, it became more difficult because of these additional variables. And today, that's what we're talking about in our prayer life is, hey, very often, prayer seems like this simple thing for us to do, right? Like we just go and we pray and we do it, but for some reason, we're not consistent and it tends to be very difficult at times, right? So we wanna relate that to our prayer life. And today, we're gonna be unpacking where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying this prayer right after he, or right before he is betrayed. And I want to start by just kind of giving us a summary statement for today that's going to kind of wrap up and button up the sum of what we're talking about. So this is really putting the series and the theme of today, uh, putting a bow on it. It's this. Prayer is not just a spiritual discipline, but prayer is hard work, right? Prayer is not just this spiritual discipline we do, but it's hard work. And why is this, Right? Why is prayer so hard? And then you have to ask this question, but if I struggle to pray, does that mean that I'm not a good Christian? Right? Like I have a hard time praying. I know I'm supposed to pray. Does that mean I'm not a good Christian? But what we're going to read today in this passage is that even Jesus, even Jesus faced difficulties when he prayed. The most closest in his circle, his disciples, the, the 12 at this point, the 11 that, that are nearest to him, struggled, struggled in this moment with prayer. We're gonna be in Matthew chapter 26 today, but before I unpack that, I, I wanna kind of set this scene for you for a moment. So Jesus is walking into the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples, and he essentially is going to this place that they frequented. Now, Pastor Caleb has a picture that we're gonna share here. This is the garden today. So this kind of gives you an idea of what Jesus was walking into when we say garden, right? There's all these different things. And the, the, the word Gethsemane translates pretty fittingly to the words oil press. Again, this was a garden that Jesus frequented often. He would go there with his disciples and he would pray. And this is the scene where we're seeing this. And I, I think the reason the word oil press is so fitting because what we're gonna read today is that the weight the weight of what Jesus' mission and fulfilling it meant was crushing to his soul. It was just so heavy and so weighty. And he walks into the garden, and I picture here at the beginning as he's walking in, and he sets the eight aside, right? He leaves the eight here and says, you guys sit here 
watch and wait. And then he goes a little further with the other three, with Peter, James, and John. And he brings them closer, further down, and then he, he sets them and says, keep, you know, keep watch and pray. And then he goes a little further, and when he goes a little further to pray, in verse, starting in verse 36, this is what we read. Again, Matthew chapter 26, and we're starting in verse 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, where he and his disciples, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And talking with him, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, so this is to the three, my soul is very sorrowful, even to the point of death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and he prayed saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping. He went back to the three and he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? One hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Verse 42, again, again for the second time, he went away and he prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and he prayed for a third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand and the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So this brings us back to the original thought, which is, so prayer is hard work and it's difficult, but, but why is this? Well, the first reason for this is because prayer requires complete honesty. Prayer requires us to be completely honest and to be completely vulnerable, right? We, we see in verse 39, uh, Jesus is being, or, or verse 38, he, he says to them, my soul is sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Here's what's important about this is up to this point, right? Up to this point in the ministry, it was Jesus that everyone went to when they had a problem, right? If there was an issue, Jesus is the one they went to. Jesus was the one who they said, hey, master, teacher, we have a problem and we need you to fix it. And here you have in verse 38, he's being so honest and real that he's struggling with the weightiness of this mission, Here's a question for us to consider. How often are we completely honest in our prayer lives? How often are we completely transparent when others ask to pray for us about what's really going on? When a friend, when a spouse, when a coworker, when a church friend says, hey, how is it going? Are we transparent with what's actually going on? Here's another question to think about. Have you ever been burned by someone when you've been completely honest with them? I'd be willing to bet that if we went around the room, all of us have at some point, right? Like we were honest, we were truthful, we were vulnerable, we bared our soul to them and they used it against us. They hurt us. And I think very often we take that hurt, we take that baggage, we take that pain of being betrayed into our prayer lives, even with God himself. And it's almost like, I don't wanna be too vulnerable with him, even though he knows everything, right? I don't wanna be too vulnerable with him because last time I did that, I got hurt. And I just cannot be vulnerable and honest with you, God. And I see this thing with everyone struggling. Everywhere I look, I see people struggling with honesty, struggling with being real, right? You look at social media. No one's posting the real pictures of the day, right? They're posting the post-fight picture of their spouse, right? Like you just got into this nasty little argument, and then you're like, all right, we're good. Hey, babe, smile. Hey, right? And they smile, and they post it. You're posting your children doing the sweetest things when we all know they're little sinners. Like, you can't fool me. I'm like, I know that little joker was running away three seconds before you took that picture. 
right? We struggle with this. We struggle with being honest and real. And for some reason, I think it's culturally, our, our culture has equated honesty to weakness. And it's like, well, the more vulnerable and the more real we are, uh, that means I'm weak because I actually have real problems. I'm a real person. But here's the thing. When it comes to our prayer life, that doesn't work. We can't hold back in our prayer life. I will tell you this. So if you're a person who struggles with being open and vulnerable and honest, I have the best solution for you. Like, this is really good. You're gonna wanna take notes. If you struggle with being open and honest and real, just go give blood, like right now, today. Like, go give blood. So I'm O positive, and I've come to learn it's not as valuable as O negative. I'm not in you guys' crowd, but I'm like second tier cool. And they call me, they call me. They're like, hey, we're gonna be outside your work tomorrow. And I'm like, well, that's strange, right? They're like, hey, we're gonna be outside of Publix. We know you shop there. Um, I mean, they're almost like, I feel like sometimes they're gonna be like, hey, look out your blinds. We're in your driveway with a blood mobile, right? So they, they chase you down. But like, when you give blood, the questions that you have to answer will crack open your soul like none other. Like, just to give you, like, this is a little bit of a joke, but like, literally the questions are like, hey, have you eaten a bat that mated with a panda and had contact with a rhino from Nigeria in like the last 30 days? I'm like, I don't, 30 days? Yeah, like, no, no, that's never happened. They ask you the most insanely personal, strange, and weird questions, right? So we have to like be vulnerable and real and honest. So prayer, it's not just this spiritual discipline, but it's hard work because it requires, again, for us to be completely vulnerable and completely honest. I want to keep reading in our passage, and I love verse 39 because I feel like so often when we look at the life of Jesus, we focus on his deity. We focus on the God side of Jesus and the miracles and the things that he's done, but this verse gives us such a great glimpse of his true humanity. So in verse 39, He says, and going a bit further, so he's left the three, he says, he fell on his face and he prayed saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Second thing about prayer and why it's work is it can often be a struggle. We'll look at a few different reasons of why. Prayer could be a struggle for many different reasons, but I think Here, it's because of the weight of what Jesus is facing, right? He's facing the reality of the mission that has to be fulfilled, and it's just weighing on his soul. And and there's something I want to point out here. It's not the death that he's he's struggling with, right? He's not worried about that part. And, And this is really important. I think it's easy to read this story and feel sorry for Jesus. But he doesn't want us to feel sorry for him. He doesn't want us to feel bad about it was terrible and it was awful, There were many people in those days that were put to death by the Romans by a method of crucifixion. That was very common. So many people died that type type of death, but what was crushing and weighing down his soul was this reality that the constant relationship that he's had with the Father for all of eternity is about to be interrupted. So there's about to be a break in the point where Jesus and the Father, they've enjoyed this fellowship for all of eternity, and this is about to be interrupted, not just interrupted, but in this interruption, God the Father is going to pour out his cup of wrath on Jesus. And why is he doing that? He's doing that for you. He's doing that for me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, For our sake he made him who knew no sin to become sin, so that in him we may become the righteousness of God. Jesus literally took off his robes of righteousness and took on our sin, our unrighteousness, so that ultimately we can spend an eternity with the Father. And the weightiness that he's facing is because he knows all that's about to happen when this disconnection takes place. And the thing that to remember, this isn't sinful. This is a look at Jesus' humanity. This is real. This is raw. This is human. Then at the end of that verse, at the end of verse 39, he says one of the most difficult phrases that I think it is for us to pray 
He says, not as I will, but as you will. Right, not as I will, but as you will. And when we pray, I think one of the reasons that we struggle with this so much is because when we pray, we have to face the reality that there's another possible outcome than the one that we're praying so desperately for. We have to get real and understand, God, I'm seeking you. I'm desperately praying for this. But there's another opportunity. There's another option of how this could come out. Earlier in the message when I was talking about the prayer room, I was talking about Simone. And I have a picture just to put a face with a name for you guys. This was taken a couple weeks before Simone passed away. And, you know, it's funny. <clears throat> Knowing Simone was such a gift, but even in that moment, she was weak and she was tired. She was ready. She had the energy to, to make fun of me when we walked in. That was, the fav that was my favorite part is she was able to make fun of me. We've known each other a long time, and it was a very sweet moment. But gosh, I remember walking out of that room and walking out of the house, and my heart broke. My heart just broke. And I told Tiff, I'm like, babe, this is like one of the hardest for me in my personal life, in my ministry life. Like, God, I'm pleading. I'm pleading for there to be another way. Lord, would you heal, would you restore? Gosh, and that's why prayer can be so difficult because if we're doing it in the way that Jesus said, the prayer that we have to pray that takes so much courage, that takes so much faith and is so very hard to even utter the words, is not my will, but yours. And as humans, as humans, from the very beginning of time, since the garden and the fall of Adam, that's not the prayer we've been praying. Starting with Adam, we're praying the prayer, not your will, but mine. So this prayer that Jesus is praying, it shifts this paradigm. I also think that we struggle with prayer because we live in a culture of distraction. We're constantly distracted, right? So something to think about, I was prepping for this week and <clears throat> I was sent this, but our attention span is actually, they've researched this. Our attention span is actually dropping each year, if you've researched this. So back in 2000, so many of you are like, 2000, I wasn't even born yet. Pipe down, pipe down, okay? Easy, easy, right? But so back in 2000, they measured it and our attention span was like 12 seconds. By the way, side note, I'm very ADD, as you know, right? And I thought about this, and I'm like, who are they surveying? Because I would have totally set that number more correct back then. They're like, this guy's attention span is like three milliseconds, right? He's chasing rabbits. So they said, hey, it's 12 seconds. Well, since 2000, so in 24 years, it's dropped all the way to eight seconds. So it's dropped four seconds. Percentage-wise, that's pretty bad. To put it in perspective, because you may be thinking, hey, eight seconds, that's not that bad. That's true. But for perspective, a goldfish's attention span is nine seconds. A goldfish would pay attention to this message more than most of you. That's crazy. We're losing to goldfish, people. Like, we've got to work on this, right? So between social media and digital everything in the world that we face, we're distracted constantly. We, we need to be entertained is really what it comes down to constantly. So one of my favorite pastors, Pastor John Piper, he says this quote about the attention span dynamic. He says, I'm convinced one of the great uses of Twitter and Facebook will be to prove at the last day that prayerlessness was not from a lack of time. Ooh. You wanna hear something crazy? He said that 15 years ago. That's unbelievable. Prophetic. Prophetic indeed. Prayer is also work, number three, because it requires persistence. We have to be persistent. So I, I want to cherry pick a couple verses here. I, I just want to say, so verse 39, I'm going to jump right a little. It says, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And then down in verse 42, again, for a second time, he went away. My father, if this cannot pass until I drink it, your will be done. And then verse 44, so leaving them again, he went away and he prayed for a third time, saying the same words again. So three times. Three times Jesus makes this request, makes this petition to the Father. 
And I think this for us is emphasizing, hey, it's really important to be persistent in our prayers. As a parent, I get this. This makes total sense to me. Because if you have kids, you get it too, right? Like, because think about your kids. When your kids are hounding you over and over and over and over for something, you hit a point where you're just like, fine, whatever, I don't care, just do it, right? And then you're like, sorry, Lord. <laughs> but I just hit this point where I'm almost like, I, I just zone out, and I'm like, I don't even care. He might have just asked to jump off the roof into the pool. I don't care, good luck. <laughs> you know, I'm not taking you to the hospital, buddy. We've already been there a lot recently. So you may find yourself persistently praying something over and over and over. And you might be again asking, like we said at the beginning, am I a good Christian? Does this mean God doesn't love me? Does this mean God isn't listening? No, it just means keep praying. Keep being persistent. Keep asking. We have to be persistent. And then four, prayer is work. Because sometimes those closest to us will let us down. Prayer is so very difficult because there are times in our life where the people that we've let closest to us, right, they're the ones that are our inner circle. There are people, and sometimes they let us down. And we see that here. We see this multiple times, right? We see in verse 40. Verse 40, he came to the disciples and found them what? sleeping. Verse 43, he comes to them and found them again sleeping for their eyes were heavy, right? Then verse 45, sleep. He came to the disciples and said, sleep, take your rest later on, right? So we've talked about the weight of what Jesus was facing in this moment. We've talked about what it is to have the crushing weight of this mission he needs to fulfill weighing down on him. And in this moment that he's facing likely the most distress of his entire ministry and life up to this point, in that moment, all he wanted was to face this with his closest friends, to have his disciples, his friends be near and to pray with him. Again, we're seeing Jesus' full humanity on display. That's very human to me, right? Have you ever faced a time in your life where this is kind of how it's gone? Where you were facing something so incredibly big, so incredibly difficult, the biggest obstacle that you've ever faced, and you're like, I cannot do this alone. I need my friends, I need my family, I need my person, those closest to me, just to be present with me. And you know how when you're facing that, and those people get near you, and your soul just gets a little lighter, and you start thinking, maybe I can handle this. This is difficult, but I think I can face this with everyone. Gosh, my wife is that person for me. I come home and I might have had the worst day in the world, right? I've had a terrible, terrible day. She's my person I go to. And she knows, she can tell. We've been married 22 years. She knows when I've had a bad day and she'll come in, sit there, you know, while I'm showering and getting ready and things and just let me vent. Sometimes she's just silent because sometimes I don't wanna talk about it. You ever had those? Where you're like, I, I don't even know the words to say right now. My heart hurts, my soul is heavy, and I just need you to be in this moment with me. But as wonderful as she is, as godly as she is, she still lets me down at times. As her husband, I still let her down at times. There are times when she needs something from me and I'm not able to do that. I don't do that. We're both humans. Right, we're both humans, we're both imperfect. It's going to happen. But here's the thing, the beauty of the gospel is there's always good news. And while my wife and I and our people in our circle are not perfect, he is. 
when my words and my comfort fall short, his never will. When I am at the bottom of the ocean and it feels like the weight of the entire thing is on me, he doesn't walk away. He doesn't fall asleep. He doesn't say you should get over it. He doesn't say it's not okay to cry. He doesn't say you need to just move on. He sits in that angst with us. He sits with us. He bears those burdens. And in those moments, we can take comfort in his provision, not the provision of the world. Prayer is not just a spiritual discipline, but hard work. So if it's so hard, why should we do it? Other than we're supposed to, why do it? Seriously, why do we do it? And this is important. I'm gonna ask everyone to lean in here this morning and listen close because I think this, this is an important part of this message and this series as we put a bow on why we should be people of prayer. And it's this. Prayer prepares us for what's to come. That's why it's so important. Right, verse 46. I love verse 46. Because we see God, or we see Jesus pouring out his soul. And then in verse 46, it's almost like there's this shift in his spirit. Right, he says, rise to the disciples. Rise, rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Gosh, you can almost feel the change in his demeanor. You can almost feel that his spirit has shifted where Jesus is like, okay, let's do this. Time to rise, boys. Time to go and face my betrayer. Jesus knew in that moment that prayer was needed to strengthen his spirit to be able to face the weight of what fulfilling that mission meant, of what was coming. That's the why, friends. Because when the storms of life and the struggles of life come, and they will, a strong prayer life also means that we have a strong relationship with the Father himself, right? Strong prayer life equals strong relationship. And it means that when it comes, we will have the ability to face it. I've been watching a lot of college basketball the last couple of days. Probably a lot of you have too. I love watching the games. And as I watch those games, I always, you know, I'm terrible to watch anything with because I like to research things. Like, they, I, this is, I'm pretty sure I'm clinical ADD, actually, at this point, now that I'm saying all this. We're working this out together. So I'm watching the games, and I start researching. I'm like, gosh, you know what I'm curious about? How much time do they spend practicing to get to this moment? So the average college athlete in, in basketball spends about 850 hours just during the season practicing. 850 hours, that's a lot of hours, right? They do that because they know that when they do that, when the game is on the line, when the shot needs to go down, they've prepared for it, right? At that point, it's almost just muscle memory. They know it's going to happen. And because they're so dialed in, because they're so practiced, because they've played this scenario out so many times, they're able to drown out the distractions, almost see it on their face where they just take a breath and they let those distractions go to the sides and they drown out the sounds of the world and for that moment they're focused on that basket can we say that about our prayer life can you say that about your prayer life are you practicing are you preparing yourself for the next season, for the next storm, for the next struggle that's going to come, not if, but when? Are you preparing for it by spending time in prayer? Because if you're waiting for the storms to come, if you're waiting for the moment of when that storm hits you, not only will you be underprepared for that moment, but you're gonna miss out on what a rich, mature, fulfilling, intimate relationship with Jesus brings into our life. So church, for this week, the practice for you is very, very simple. Say, well, how do we put teeth into this message? How do we put teeth into this message? It's very simple. Very, very simple. I'm gonna give you one thing. 
take this prayer guide this week and do it. Five, 10 minutes a day. If we don't have five or 10 minutes just being real for the Lord, we probably need to evaluate our priorities. We're too busy, men. We're too busy, women. We're too busy, kids. If we don't have five to 10 minutes to do something that could completely change and alter our life in the best ways possible, we need to relook at our, our time. Just take this this week, starting today, go through this. That's all we're asking. Stop scrolling through your feed and spend a few minutes in prayer, right? Stop watching TikToks and TV and YouTubes and all this junk and start praying. Stop reading meaningless articles that generally only bring division and start reading something that's actually worthwhile. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I just wanna encourage you. You've heard about how prayer can be hard work, but also, also I hope you've heard there's nothing greater in the world than having a relationship with the one who put breath into your lungs. That changes everything. And if you want to change everything in the best ways possible, Jesus can do that. I would just encourage you to do that. Right, you heard what Jesus was willing to do for you. What are you willing to do for him? If you made a decision this uh, today to follow Jesus, would you text the word Jesus to our phone number here? If you were uh, want to be baptized, text the word baptism. If you need prayer, I encourage you, take that prayer card, fill it out and drop it in, or even better, in just a few moments, our prayer team is gonna come forward and when they do, find them, hug their neck and pray with them. Forget what it looks like to everyone in the room. They don't care. Worry about you and Jesus. If you wanna be a part of what God is doing here at Redemption Church through the act of giving, we, we believe generosity is the way of Jesus. Everything else is the way of the world. If you wanna give to the mission, that God is doing here at Redemption Church, you can do it in one of three ways. You can text the word give to this phone number, 863-777-4726. You can download our app uh, online, redemptionlakeland.com. And we also have in-person giving stations in the back. So feel free to take part of that and, and be a part. Again, as Pastor Brandon said a moment ago, thank you for your generosity. You guys are some of the most generous people I've ever had the privilege of knowing, and it is a joy to be a part of this community.